Uh, she comes from Twenty. She works at and Twenty, and she worked in Amazon too. And she's going to talk about the client side rendering. So, thank you. Thank you. So, <laughs> so well, this is kind of an intimidating stage, but the title of this talk seems like kind of going to start a flame war with what Alex said earlier, right? But we were talking about this at dinner, where we were seated together earlier, and it's really, I agree with he, what he's saying, that client side rendering is really easy and fast, if and only if you have thought your application to be used in that scenario from the start. Because if you try to fit client side rendering to an application that already has JavaScript problems, small or big, then your problems just got bigger because you have more JavaScript in the client, right? So you got what you, the opposite of what you were trying to achieve. You were trying to achieve a more responsive UI and now you have a less responsive UI. So this talk is about the problems that we face when we try, it's our story really. I will be showing some code, but it's the, if I really want to show the problems that you will face if you were to do client-side rendering in an application that is not thought that way from the beginning, right? And also the choice of template engine matters, right? You cannot do client-side rendering with any template engine. It matters a lot. Let me see if this clicker works, yes. So this is my name. I work at 20, which for those of you that are not from Spain, is a social network based in Spain. We have about, I would say, as of the stats of yesterday, we have, 80, we have 8 million users, 8 active, and we have about 40 million users registered. And if you think that in Spain there is about 40 million people, that is a lot of people registered. We are about 150 engineers, and on 20 I work on the front-end team, which, the front-end framework team, which we do JavaScript rendering, what we're going to talk about today, but we also do more things that are like the back end of the front end, right? Like preparing the site for SSL, um, doing HTTP development, we deal with the load balancer, so we do several other things. And the work I'm going to talk about it here, some of it is from 2010, so, and some of it is from three months ago, so it's a mix of things. Ay, sorry. I'll, I'm going to pass through some slides very fast because I think by the, with the talks prior, we all know what clients are rendering all about, right? Instead of sending you all the content, I send you data, add with some template engine on the client, you turn that into content. And this template engine, of course, is JavaScript. And this data can be JSON or it can really be anything. You can choose your convention. So uh, a template would look like what we have above, Right? That would be a template, and this would be the data that comes back and forth, and you just put it where it belongs. And the part that puts everything where it belongs is the template engine. So this kind of makes you think that you need a template engine and you need templates. So you need loads of JavaScript in the client that you didn't have prior. And if you have loads of JavaScript in the client to start with, then users start thinking that there may be some issues that you may have, right? Because more JavaScript in the client may mean performance problems. And I need a little to kind of frame what 20 does in order to see the relevance of this problem. So we serve about 1 billion page requests every day. And this is, for American speakers, for Spanish speakers, this is 1,000 million, right? because a billion in Spanish means something different. So a thousand million page requests every day. And as of last year, because this, these stats are of last year, those two particular ones, we have a still 0.5% on i6, but 0.5% of one billion is a lot of page views, right? And 10% is a ton of page views on i7, right? And we also have a loading bar in that artifact that we all love, right? And the loading bar started because we had way too much JavaScript on the client. And of course, with, and that was probably 2009. 
So someone thought, let's just put a loading bar because that makes everything better, right? And after someone thought, let's just put an add to go with the loading bar. And then that loading bar was there to stay, right? Because the people that sell ads really love the loading bar, right? And we have also like what is called a, a thick JavaScript client or a one-page application. And we are localized, because for those of you that don't know that, Spain has uh, of more than one official language, right? So, Catalá, Gallego, and Euskera, and we also offer 20 in Portuguese. So, it's localized in, in several languages. And then we go back, right? We have loads of JavaScript in the client, and those ads that our people that sell ads love, so at some point last year, we end up with this. Like the site started going slower and slower. And this is, this is how much JavaScript we had in the client, right? Suddenly we have like a ton. I mean, we measure it and we didn't even know how did we got there. So it is impossible that the application was fast, right? And much less so on IE6 because there's much to JavaScript. There's too much JavaScript. So that was our performance problem number one that all the JavaScript that we were loading, we were loading it eagerly, right? Because we have that handy loading bar, so just shove it all in, like tons of requests are happening. And loading eagerly doesn't mean that you're loading synchronously, right? You can be loading asynchronously, which means that your request is not synchronous, but you're loading JavaScript that you don't really need at all because it's for a page that the user hasn't even seen or maybe it's not even going to see. And we had two extra problems on top of that one, is that the templates that we were using to do clients and rendering on the very beginning, and this is a while back, this is like a year back, they were HTML documents, right? So the templates look like this, just like what I showed prior, which is, this is not very different from a modern, more modern template, but these templates were being fetched like HTML, HTML, and if you're in the browser, you, the browser doesn't have a protocol to fetch HTML, right? The browser knows how to fetch uh, CSS and JavaScript. But if you have to fetch HTML documents, you need to make an Ajax request or a full page request. But you need to make like a request that is going to be not so fast. And because those HTML templates have to have the data inserted in them, by walking the DOM, that makes it even slower, right? So this goes back to the, what I was saying prior, that the choice of template engine matters a lot because if your template engine needs to do loads of DOM operations, we all know that that's not going to work so well because JavaScript is not a slow language, but the DOM is slow, and much slower as you go back in browsers. So what happens, and this was like, you can see, this is kind of a, this is kind of a small, because I had to port all these to OpenOffice just before, because uh, Google, the presentation Google wasn't working that great. So it's kind of a small, but I'll explain it. This is the usage of IE in 20. This is October in 2010, and at the end is October 2011, right? Of a year of data for IE. So, I mean, IE7 is decreasing. It starts at 10%, but it's slowly decreasing. And I6 was 0.5%, but all of a sudden one day it doesn't show up anymore because the amount of JavaScript is much too large and I6 just cannot take it. So this was like the turning point where it's like, mm, nothing that we will ever do is going to work. So kind of like mindset change. So we have to think truly about our browser support and we decided to drop I6. But I personally think like dropping, and maybe because I work at Amazon where that's never done, you never drop users that are likely to buy anything, like and say, hey, sorry, we don't support you. Never, right? So I6, what we did, and someone had this good idea that was to move it to the mobile site. Because we have a mobile site that we built for the PSP, because our users, some of them are very young, and we have users, we have a big user base that is between 14 and 17. So their mobile device of choice to browse the web is the PSP, which if you try to use it to browse the web, it makes you feel really old because it's really hard to figure out how to browse the web with that. But, 
but you can do it, and it actually doesn't look so bad. The only thing is that it doesn't support JavaScript at all. If you ask it, if it supports JavaScript, it says yes. And you try to insert something on the DOM, and everything blows up. So it doesn't. So we, because we get about one million page views with that every day, we decided to build a site with, that the PSP could use and uh, navigate pretty good. And what we did was sending i6 to this site that we have. And now i6 is all happy, right? Because the site looks like it's 1995. And yeah, that he can do that with no problem. And i7, we still decided that we needed to support. So for some time, we started thinking that our problem was rendering. Because we were trying to do rendering and it wasn't working so well. So we decided to, to change our rendering technology, right? And we tried this new technology that was faster on IE7 than Chrome. And that was for real. And this was Chrome 10 or something, but it was for real. And it was XSLT. And yeah, that was faster in some scenarios, but tons of problems that had nothing to do with the speed, because XSLT is truly fast. And because it's native to IE, it's really very fast in IE to any version that you use it with. But it also has problems to, to know, and besides it being ugly, like nothing else, the, the browser implementation is older than the actual implementation on XSLT. And also, you cannot do dynamic subtemplating. I mean, it's like deciding what partials are you showing at any time for your data, right? Like you have a data set, and with this data set, upon this condition, I need these three templates, but upon this other condition, I need these other two templates. That was very hard to do with XSLT because it's designed for like a static data transformation. And added translations was like poof, a project. Like it, it was like very difficult to do, and that should be trivial because since the site is localized, we want our templates to be localized too, which adds another level of complexity to client-side rendering, right? But that's something that the client, that the render side, the rendering engine has to support very easily. Okay. And then it was another call to step back and think about it all over again, because we just need to take a fresh new approach to how our client work and our architecture in the front end. So the biggest shift that we needed to do was to load the JavaScript lazily. And this means what I was saying prior, that the JavaScript needs to be loaded when you need it. You don't need to need it. You don't need to load it right away, right? There is. Because if you have tons of JavaScript on the client, it goes without saying that nothing is going to go fast. You cannot do clients are rendering and expect to have like a smooth UI. You need to think about your application prior. And after evaluating a bunch of tools, and I don't think it required JS was, was that finished at the time, we decided to go with UE, which is a little more complicated to use than required OJS, a little more complicated to set up, but it's also, it has a stronger feature set, right? Because not only do you get the dynamic loading system, but you also get the, the library itself, right? And for UI, we needed to do, we needed to change many things among which we needed to set up a domain from which we can serve our UI files in the combination that works for us. So I'll, I'll talk a little about how did we set up the, the dynamic load code for ourselves, but there is different ways to do this, right? We use PHP on the server and we as, I don't know if anyone knows this, everyone knows this, but PHP doesn't support annotations natively, right? So we wanted to annotate the controllers Java style and tell this controller, which is albums, that it needed to pull up that JavaScript, which is the JavaScript for 20 albums. And instead of writing, you could do this with a configuration file somewhere, but if in 20 we have about 150 engineers, so it's nice when you don't have to have one file that everyone needs to modify to do anything, right? It's easier to federate the information with annotations and that after the files get built. So there is a pretty handy framework for annotations called Addendum for PHP, which it abstracts all the annotation problem in PHP and you can write them. 
And what it does later is that it opens the file, does some regex, and figures out the annotations, since annotations are not native. And we use that at build time to build a, a file that you can use to do the lookups. But for the developers, it's pretty easy. They just annotate the controllers with the JavaScript that is to be used. So if this is the page in which I will click to do the request, the, this is pseudocode because it really doesn't look like that. But that click has, is really done with events, attaching events, but this will work just as well, right? It ha there is a bootloader application that knows how to request the, when I build this link, knows that I need this album showcase, right? Which is a, a GUI module that I'm going to have to download. And this, in JavaScript, translates to the UI use which does an HTTP request for that module, but also for all the dependencies of it, right? It, wor it walks down the dependency tree and it figures out everything that it needs to fetch. So, and this is kind of blurry, but hopefully you guys on the last, I, right there can see it. So this is the album page, and when the user clicked to come here, that was a request done to this file that was in there prior. And the file, of course, has to be minimized and version, and the dependency tree has to be version aware, right? But setting up that with you is pretty easy. You just need a static domain that has some code that knows how to interpret this URL and serve you the whole dependency tree. That, that part UI doesn't provide, but it's very simple to do. Once you have the artifacts built in a way that you can do a lookup for this file and see which are all the other files that I need. So this gives us the freedom to remove the loading bar because now we can fetch what we need dynamically. And we actually, at, at the end, we ended up taking the decision of rewriting the whole client. So we're working in a new 20 to be released pretty soon that doesn't have a loading bar. And the first page load is five times faster than the one we had prior. Five times faster after the loading bar finishes. So in the, sorry, I'll, I'll explain that again. What I mean is like before it was the loading bar and still there was a flash of content and the things were not quite ready. So now you get there five times faster and everything is ready for you to use. And the other side of the deal for rendering uh, is that we needed to start from scratch on the template engine, right? Because client-side rendering you, is something that you must have for a one-page application. Like if you have a chat, the chat doesn't have a server-side component, right? Our chat, the JavaScript is talking to an Erlang server. So I don't want to introduce like server-side template in there, right, to render the chat. I want to render the page and silently render some things and show the chat, look who's connected. And all that, I want it to happen on the client for what Alex was saying before, that we want to give user fa as fast feedback as fast as we can. And after doing some performance tests, we decided to use handlebars. And I'll go, handlebars, probably, I don't know if everyone knows how it works then. How many people have used handlebars here? Well, some, not very many. Dust, no one. Well, yeah, some people. And mustache. So some people for mustache. Seems like handlebars is getting to be the, the favorite for adoption. And for us, it, the criteria was performance, easy of use, and contributions to the GitHub, right? The guy that, that does handlebars, he's very active and he's improving it all the time. Dust, which is very similar to handlebars, is much forgotten. So I don't know if it, if it is because since LinkedIn uses it, the guy that used to contribute works at LinkedIn, or I'm not sure, but it, there is no contributions to it for like a year. And we also tested handlebars on the server, because even if we do server-side rendering, our idea is to move out from PHP templating towards handlebars in the server. So for some numbers, and I can tweet the details of this, but handlebars with Node in the server, in which PHP and Node communicate via socket, right? So you open a socket from PHP, talk to Node, give it the data, and say, now give me the render, that works just as fast as PHP native templating, 
which is really fast because that's what PHP does best. I mean, it's really crappy for other things, but for templating, it's great. So it's really a very good choice if performance is your concern. And also because it can be pre-compiled easily with a module for handlebars for Node. And also handlebars in the client, personally, I like it better than Mustache because I think that a, a template engine with no logic doesn't really allow room for display logic, which is something different from business logic, and many people mix those two concepts, right? Display logic is the logic that goes into saying, I want to build a table, and every third row is of a different color. That's not a business rule, right? That is a UI rule that should only exist on the UI. So Handlebars does that pretty good because it has like if, else, and uh, flow statements that help you do that. And more important, if Handlebars is like CoffeeScript, it is built on JSON, which is a, a lexical parser, right? So just, just like CoffeeScript is a grammar that compiles into JavaScript, Handlebars is a grammar in HTML that is going to be compiled into JavaScript later, thanks to JSON that is, is pretty amazing. Like, everyone should check it out. So if a template, a template would look like this when you write it, right? And after we, we use the NPM module for handlebars and to compile the templates, this is something that, that the build does on its own. And we go from that template to some compiled JavaScript that I'm going to show, but it would look something like this. And it's not for to read the code, but it's just to show that instead of having DOM lookups, now what we're doing is just concatenating strings, which is something that even Internet Explorer 7 can do pretty fast. So I've removed this problem that I had prior with the DOM manipulation because my templates no longer need to manipulate the DOM. I mean, they just concatenate the strings. And the, the compilation is a total win, right? Because for a site that receives as much traffic as ours, we couldn't compile the templates on the fly and serve them fast enough, right? And having, having them pre-compiled is, I mean, it's a factor I don't remember, but it's, it's a couple, couple orders of magnitude. And the guy that works in handlebars, we found a small bugs on the node implementation of the compiler, and he fixed them the same day. I mean, he's very re responsive and real nice to work with, so we really like that. And so the templates now have become part of this dynamic loading system of code, right? Because by the time the build finishes, the templates are JavaScript. So now I can plug them in on my dynamic system that I had before, right? So this link that I had before that was downloading the, that was downloading the T photo module, now it knows because I've, I've set up a dependency tree that it also needs the T photo templates. So this is something that you have to work with in UI, but UI knows how to do really well. I know that I need a tphoto module that uses the tphoto templates that by that time they are JavaScript, and also it uses the photo i18n, right? And we set it up in a way that when you request a module, it only gives you the localization for that module because we think we're going to have 20 in, in more than five languages. It's probably going to be 15. So then you have to have a, a, a loading system for JavaScript that is also localized. Otherwise, you're downloading tons of localization that you don't need. So the petition that we had prior is a little more complicated now, right? Because you, you have more JavaScript, but also you have to download the templates, the localization that goes with that, and the components that go together. But it's still, it's pretty easy to see what is going on at every moment. And the, our idea is next quarter to release the work to, that we did with our i18n libraries for handlebars. Because the code that you have to write in handlebars is as simple as this. And it also supports parameter parsing. And we support like Czechian, Slovakian, not only Spanish, but Czechian, Slovakian, English. Portuguese, Italian, so it's based on, get, on the get text implementation for JavaScript that somebody else did. 
we just added some performance improvements and, and wrote a, a small library on top of it for handlebars. And our idea is, if we can export it, release it open source. Um, so the thing is that we had to decide whether we could use client-side rendering for everything. And we decided that it make a lot of sense in instances like I was talking prior, like the chat. But there is other instances in which it didn't, because performance-wise, didn't work for us at all. Like our first page load, render client-side, which a lot is lower than server-side. So um, we, we use it frequently in features that only exist client-side, like the chat UI, the spinners, overlays, which are like UI artifacts, right? Those don't, do not have a similar entity server-side. But we also use it for features in which we have measured that rendering client-side serves as CPU. It may be that for some browsers, the latency is identical, rendering client-side versus server-side. But we measure that it's significant CPU savings. So the photo page in 20 is all render client-side because it literally uh, save us money to let rendering client side. It's also very fast because it's only a photo and some tags, right? But it, it saves us money because it saves us machines to be able to render client side. And our next plan, which we also like to do next quarter, which is getting kind of packed up with projects, is that we would like to set up, go beyond the POC of rendering server side with, with handlebars and node that what I said before, it's pretty fast. In the beginning, we thought that we may use m the mustache implementation for PHP and kind of enhance it to have like a PHP handlebars. But after we decided against that, not only because the, the current mustache implementation of PHP is very slow, it's about five times slower than PHP templating, but also because handlebars and node works great together. I mean, it's, it works really well, it's very fast. And it's easy to use, as I said before, right? Like opening a socket that communicates to PHP and using that to render and send it to the, to the client. And also it's very nice that handlebars escapes by default, right? So you don't have to remember to escape your stuff. It already knows that it has to escape. And if you don't want to escape, you tell it so. And that's a good feature to have. And for the, I had like three major points that if, that I like people to take from this talk. The first one is not to think about problems in isolation, because when we start thinking about rendering on the client, we kind of forgot that we have tons of problems already on the client, in localization and performance and our browser makeup. So you have to think problems uh, uh, in a whole way, right? Like wholesome, if that is a word. And rendering the client is gonna work if your application is designed for that, right? And you need to use the right tool of the, for the job because not not, you couldn't render everything the same way. And you have to measure and decide which is your criteria to take. Maybe because I come from a size background, but I always think that you have to have some measurable criteria to take decision, technical decisions, right? It could be performance or it could be easy of use, but you have to have a criteria in which you can measure that. For us, it was definitely easy of use, but also performance. And having measurements to quantify that to our product managers and such, it, it helped a lot to get the time that we needed to implement what was needed. So the new 20 that we are hoping to release pretty soon is about five times faster than the one we had prior. And part of it is the rendering, but most of it is the dynamic loading of, of JavaScript. We now think we have removed all our JavaScript issues and we are back to CSS. So we were, our current flame at work is whether we're gonna use CSS3 selectors or not, which you can guess in what side the designers are and in what side the we are fighting for. I don't know, it, it's, I need to learn a lot more about CSS because I don't know much at all, but, but there are some cur curious effects, even on Chrome, of using tons of CSS3 selectors. So this, w this is kind of material for another talk that I hope to give some time once we have figured out what is our, our plan going there. Um, this is all I have.
Time for questions. Thank you very much.